Okay, thank you for coming today. I appreciate the ones who are here in person and also those that might be watching or listening later after the fact. We are at Riverside Baptist Church of Harrison County and we are in Sunday school and we're studying the book of Job and we've gotten up to Job chapter 32. Now Job chapter 32 through chapter 37, those six chapters, that's six chapters, Elihu is going to be speaking. Job had silenced the three friends that we had been listening to, which, you know, were the, the other ones. That was the Eliphaz and Zophor and Bildad. So they're done. They're finished. Job had silenced them. Elihu was angry at them because they had falsely accused Job. So Elihu was angry at the three friends because they had falsely accused Job. And he was angry with Job because as the argument wore on, Job increasingly was intent on justifying himself rather than justifying God, at least in Elihu's opinion he was. And there was some truth in that. Now it was Elihu's turn to tell them a thing or two. Elihu correctly points out that Job is coming very close to accusing God of being unjust. Elihu paves the way for God's speech to Job, and in the end, God is angry with the first three friends, but not with Elihu. So we know that Elihu's speech was more on point and more correct because God did not rebuke him. God jumped, God, you know, rebuked the first three, but not Elihu. Now, the reason Elihu had waited is because he was the youngest. And in that day and time, when people would gather around to discuss things, the older people were looked up to as being the most wise and the smartest and the most knowledgeable, so they got to go first. But in this case, Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar were not the wisest. Elihu was, and so after he had listened for a long time and not said nothing, now he's ready to speak. So Elihu joins the dialogue in chapters 32 to 37. So that's six chapters, six chapters. You always subtract and add one. That's the way you do that in math. So if you've got 32 to 37, 32 minus 30, 37 minus 32 is five, and you add one, that's six. Or if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, like my fifth graders, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, six chapters. Okay, so because Elihu is taking six chapters, what we're going to do is cover two a week for the next three weeks. So we're going to listen, to, and by the way, they're kind of broken up that way because actually Elihu really has four different speeches. And they're kind of broken up almost the way we're going to look at it. So uh, if they were just three addresses or three speeches, and by the way, some think there were just three, then it would it would be <laughs> perfect with the way we're doing it. But a lot of people think it's four instead, so whatever. We're gonna the way we're gonna cover them is two a week. So in the next unit of the book of Job, a new character is in, introduced. Elihu was a young man who had grown angry while listening to Job justify himself rather than God. But he was also upset with Job's friends because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now, by the way, we learned that from verse 2 and 3 of what we're about to read, okay? Verse 2, we learned that he's upset with Job. Verse 3, we learned he's upset with Job's friends. It is true that Job's situation has not improved. God appears to have become an enemy and without just cause. And perhaps the most perplexing aspect of the whole situation is God's complete silence and unresponsiveness to Job's prayers. Indeed, the comfort of Job's three counselors seems to have hindered his understanding of his relationship to God. So Elihu, hoping to rectify the situation, began with a long apology for his youth and a plea for them to pay close attention and careful attention since wisdom is a gift of God rather than a consequence of age. So one of the first thing Elihu's going to do when we start reading here, you'll see that he defends himself 
because normally people wouldn't listen to a young man. But he says that wisdom is a gift from God rather than just something you automatically get with age. And we know that's true today. There's some old people who are, when it comes to God's word and when it comes to true wisdom, they don't have a clue. Mm -hmm. And there are young, some young people who are very real grounded in scripture who are very wise at a young age. So Elihu addresses Job directly and recapitulated the problem as one of unanswered prayer. Elihu contended that God used suffering and chastisement to correct humankind. And prayer is humanity's method of acknowledging and submitting to God's correction. When we get to chapter 34, which will be next week, Elihu embarked upon a second speech in which he reproached Job for questioning God's justice. God is just, and by, not, and by denying this, Job had added rebellion to his sin. In a third discourse or speech, Elihu informed Job that God was unaffected by events on earth. If God has been silent, it was because he recognized insincerity in Job's request. Finally, Elihu spoke on God's behalf, and he informed Job and his counselors that God is just in his treatment of king and slave alike, and in any situation, no matter what it is, repentance is always the key. As in other cases, Job's afflictions and sufferings may be the means of deliverance. And then in chapter 38, which we won't get to chapter 38 for four weeks, but when we get there, that's my favorite part of the book because God himself is going to speak. So God is going to speak through four whole chapters in part of uh, the last chapter. So that's my favorite part of the book, and we'll be there in about one month. We'll be at my favorite part of Job. All right, so with that background and with that little bit of knowledge on the background uh, of Elihu, and I'll share some more about Elihu uh, next week and the week after. I saved a little bit about him for the next two Sundays. I didn't want to do all of it today. Since the next three Sundays, we will be talking about Elihu. But let's go ahead and read the the first two chapters of Elihu's speeches, which is chapter 32 and 33. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzad of the kindred of Ram, against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. And Elihu, the son of Arachiel, the Buzite, answered and said, I am young and ye are very old. Wherefore I was afraid and durst not show you mine opinion. I said, days shall speak, and multitudes of years shall teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. Therefore I said, hearken to me, and I also will show mine opinion. <coughs> Excuse me. Behold, I waited for your words. I gave ear to your reason while she searched out what to say. Yea, I attended unto you, and behold, there was none of you that convinced Job or that answered his words. Yes, she should say, We have found out wisdom. God thrusteth him down, not man. Now he hath not directed his words against me, neither will I answer him with your speeches. They were amazed. They answered no more. They left off speaking. When I had waited, for they spake not, but stood still and answered no more, I said, I will answer also my part, I also will show mine opinion. For I am full of matter, the spirit within me constraineth me. Behold, my belly is as wine which hath no vent, it is ready to burst like new bottles. I will speak that I may be refreshed, I will open my lips and answer. Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto man. For I know not to give flattering titles, in so doing my maker would soon take me away. So in this first chapter of Elihu's speeches, the first thing he does 
after we learn that he's angry with Job and he's angry with the three people, the three older men that spoke, Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar, he tells them that they need to listen to him because even though he's young, he's got wisdom. And he said, I let y'all talk first because I thought y'all would be wise, but y'all turned out not to be very wise. And he waited and gave them a chance to answer what he just said. But they didn't. They had nothing to say because they knew he was correct. So then, after he had waited for them to say something and none of them spoke up, including Job, then he's going to start talking. So at the end of this chapter, he begins to get ready to really get into what he wants to say, which he really gets into what he wants to stay, say in verse 1 of the next chapter, and then he goes on. So let's look at chapter 33, starting at verse 1 now. Wherefore, Job, I pray thee, hear my speeches and hearken to all my words. Behold, now I have opened my mouth, my tongue hath spoken in my mouth. My words shall be of uprightness in my heart, and my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. If thou canst answer me, set thy words in order before me, stand up. Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid, neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. Surely thou hast spoken in mine hearing, and I have heard the voice of thy words, saying, I am clean without transgression, I am innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. Behold, he findeth occasion against me, he counteth me for his enemy. He putteth my feet in the stocks, he marketh all my paths. Behold, in this thou art not just. I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Why dost thou strive against him? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. For God speaketh once, yet twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men and slumberings upon the bed, then he opened the ears of men and sealed their under instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from the perishing by the sword. He is chastened also with pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain, so that his life abhorred bread and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. Yea, his soul draweth near to the grave, and his life to the destroyers. It's, if there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto him man his uprightness, then he is gracious unto him, and saith, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's, and he will return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. He looketh upon men, and if any say I have sinned, and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man to bring back his soul from the pit to be enlightened with the light of the living. Mark well, O Job, hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I will speak. If thou hast anything to say, answer me, speak, for I desire to justify thee. If not, hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I shall teach thee wisdom. So in this chapter, he is saying several things. One of which he says, first of all, he tells Job, look, I'm not going to attack you like your other three friends. He's telling Job, I'm not attacking you personally. I'm just saying what I believe to be true and to be wise. And so he says that God speaks to men many times in ways, but they're not ready to listen. And he mentions that sometimes God speaks to men in visions, especially in that day and time. And why was that? What did they not have? The Bible. The Bible. So in that day and time especially, God spoke in visions. God spoke in dreams. God spoke in the zodiac before it was corrupted. He spoke in the heavens. 
okay? It was Nimrod at the Tower of Babel. He is the one who uh, corrupted the Zodiac and changed some of it. But originally, the heavens and the stars and all was there to help Adam and some of them that didn't have the Bible to understand God's plan. So God does speak to people. That's what Elihu is saying. But many times people are not ready to listen. God speaks to people today through their conscience. They know before they do something they shouldn't do it, but what do they do? They rebel and do it anyway. They rebel and do it anyway. A person who commits a very uh, serious sin, he knows, he, he feels something in his heart. I don't care what anyone says. I don't care what anyone says. He feels something from, from God through his conscience. Unless, unless he has sinned so many times, the same sin that God has allowed him to harden his own heart, like Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then he may not feel anything. But God spoke to, God, listen, God speaks to every living human being after the age of accountability in many different ways, but they don't listen. That's why God don't send no one to hell. People send themselves because they rebel against God and don't listen. So that is part of what Elihu is saying here. He also says <coughs> that in many cases, not every case, but in many cases, God also speaks to people through chastening. Now, chastening is a word for discipline or spanking. So a lot of times when we are disciplined and we have problems, it is God teaching us through the situation. You turn your, if you're a Christian, listen, the Bible says if you're a Christian and you turn your back on God and you keep it up, God may just take you out completely. There is a sin unto death. And I do believe it's for the Christian who turns his back on God and won't come back. And God takes you out to where you will not continue to be a bad influence on other people. And you're going to heaven, but you're not going to get all the rewards that other people will get because the Bible teaches that every Christian stands before not the great white throne judgment, but the judgment seat of Christ to receive rewards based on what they've done since they became a Christian and to whom have done much, many rewards will be given because God is 100% just and fair. So that is part of what Elihu is saying here, that God speaks to people in many different ways, especially back in that day, and God speaks to people quite often through discipline but they just rebel against God and turn against him and they can't see the forest for the tree, so to speak. Okay? So next Sunday, we're going to take a look at chapter 34 and 35. And chapter 34 begins another speech, the second speech or the second address. And so we're going to take a look next week at Elihu's second speech next week. And so anyway, if you would, go ahead and read chapter 34 and 35 for next Sunday. Now, I'm going to tell you a good way to do this, if you have not done it yet, a good way to do this to help you understand the whole speech is to read the whole speech without stopping. So start at 32 verse 1 if you haven't done so and read all the way through until you get to the last of Elihu's speeches. And remember, that's the end of chapter 37. So start at 32.1 and read all the way through the end of 37. And then come back, if you would, and reread verse 30, uh, chapter 34 and 35 for next Sunday. But that will help you understand better what Elihu actually said and what he's saying. Okay, our time is up for now, and that's perfect because I've said all I wanted to say for today. Like I said, next Sunday I'll be talking a little bit more about Elihu. I'll tell you what his name meant 
and who he was and who he wasn't, things like that, next Sunday. And I've saved even a little bit about him for the third Sunday. So each Sunday I'm going to tell you a little bit about Elihu, since he's the one speaking, and we will specifically look at chapter 34 and 35 next week. The Dixie Echoes will be here on March the 6th. That is a week from this coming Saturday. A week from this coming Saturday at 3 o'clock p.m. It's a Saturday afternoon. The Dixie Echoes will be here in concert at our church. And I wanted to be sure that I put it on all my videos today and next week as well. So that people will, if they're looking at the videos, they'll hear it that way as well. So let's have a closing word of prayer together. Dear Holy Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for all your blessings, and thank you for each and every person here, each family represented. Thank you for the wisdom, Lord, that you teach us and give us through the study of your Holy Word. And I pray now for the Dixie Echoes as they come in a couple of weeks, for Daryl and Tawana Johnson as they come in seven or eight weeks, and then Trevor Thomas as he comes in about 12 or 13 weeks. And I pray that through all of these different ministries, Lord, we would reach out to new people and that we would help draw people closer to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.